We declare to hell tonight, God, that you are holy and there is no one like you, God. You are holy. Jesus, we love you. Just for a moment, could we just thank him for the access that we have into his presence? The veil is torn. There's no barrier between us and him tonight, but there's open access into his throne. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus.
here in this moment as we're just coming still in the presence of God. I'm just going to let him minister to us right here. Everyone here, if you can, just stand before him. We're all standing before his throne. The amazing thing about Jesus is while he can see all of us at once, he can see each of us at once as if we were the only person there. And he has this amazing ability to be intimate with you and know what's in your heart and to impart his to yours. Father, here in your presence, the presence of your son, in the heart of every person in here. Lord, that we will begin to hear the things we need to hear. We'll receive from you, Lord, the things we need to receive, even for tonight. So many hopes around this room, people carrying great longings about our future, Lord, my future, our future. receive right here your presence into our lives. We receive your power into us right here. We receive right here the Spirit of God is beginning to fall upon people all over this room. Hey, all over this place, Lord, your Spirit. Right over here, the Spirit of God is this, right here just beginning to minister to you, the Holy Ghost. As you sense the presence of God coming upon you, just begin to lift your hands. Right, right here in this room, as you begin to sense the presence of God, just begin to lift your hands in this place. Father, I thank you that your power is beginning to descend right now upon men and women in the name of Jesus. The blind places are being removed where we have been unable to see things, Lord. Somehow there's a blinder being removed in the name of Jesus. And the eyes of the heart are being opened and enlightened. Right here, don't stop. Just keep looking for him. The Holy Spirit settling upon you right there, settling upon this whole house. Whether you're new or been here for years, Lord, your power is opening the eyes of the heart tonight. All over this room, you're opening the eyes of the heart. weights. It's coming off of you right now in the name of Jesus. Like feel it just coming off of your mind and off of your shoulders. As we get ready to hear the word of God tonight, we're going to be released in the presence of God. As you begin to sense that freedom and that liberty coming over you, just begin to lift your voices to the Lord all over this place. Let's let the fruit of our lips give thanks for a moment. Just in his presence as you are with him as we are with him sound of many voices. Let's begin to arise in this place. Let the worship just begin to arise from your own hearts with your own lips. That multitude of sound and that mystery of heaven. Let's let it arise, let it arise, let it arise, let it arise. Let's let the worship arise from your own hearts. See you, Lord. Oh, God. Yeah. 
Yes, let it arise, let it arise, let it arise. Holy, let it arise, holy, holy. We're becoming the anthem of praise. Instead of keep rising, church, let the aroma of that begin to arise. Let it arise, let it arise, let it arise. We're joining with the angels, let it arise, let your worship arise. Just let that, let's let that praise arise right here all over this place. Let me check it out. Let's just praise arise all over this place. Just let it go. Just let it go. Praise arise all over this house. Let's let it arise all over this house. Sustain this for a moment. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Church, let it arise. Let it arise.
Let's all sing it together like a choir. Sing it one more time, holy. Just the women, just the women. Come on, ladies, sing it. Holy. Come on, sisters. One more time. Sisters, mothers, daughters, sing it, ladies. One more time. together now. can just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment and the Spirit of God is falling upon people. Oh, there it is. The sound of many tongues and diverse tongues. Thank you, Father. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Everyone, if you're baptized in the Spirit in this place, if you're not, come up to the front. But if you are, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. If you're not, come up here and we'll lay hands on you. But right here, the Spirit of the Lord is moving. Right here, just begin to pray in diverse tongues and in intercession. This for a moment. The Spirit of God is harnessing this meeting, harnessing this movement, harnessing this moment. Walls are moving, territories are opening, things are shaking. Come on, church, don't stop. Jericho's walls are shaking. The walls in Raleigh are shaking. Let it begin to arise. Grounds are shaking. Ground is shaking. Territory is opening. Territory is opening. The ground is moving. Pray strong for a moment in the spirit. your neighborhood, your business. The Spirit of God is moving. Angels are on the move. Father, we thank you that your power is prevailing. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church that you are building.
the plow is moving. The plow is in the earth and it's moving. Thank you, Father. Yes, yes, God, for the East Coast. A move of God coming to this part of the world. Jesus, make it happen. We receive your grace. Let that fire burn one more time. Let that fire burn one more time. Pray in the Holy Ghost one more time. Just, just one more time. Let that fire burn. You're interceding for your future. You're interceding for the lives of people that are being ready to be caught up into an updraft of God's power in this part of the world. It's going to affect your friends and your neighbors, your associates, your relatives. Your friends, your relatives, your associates, and your neighbors, they're all going to be swept up in it. Come on, let that roar of the Spirit go on just for another moment. There's a roar of the Spirit. There's a roar of the Spirit. Let it burn. It's like a fire that's roaring. Well, Father, tonight we just bow low so that you can stand up strong. But Lord, we thank you for, Lord, the sound that's resonating in the atmosphere in this place tonight. We thank you for the residual sound that's now beginning to move in the earth. God, we thank you that you both grant us a door open in heaven and a door into the earth where the gospel and the kingdom of God can invade. And so, Lord, tonight as we stand under an open door in an open heaven, Lord, we thank you for the door in the earth that's swinging open even wider and broader. Lord, let tonight be a moment of commissioning in the presence of God. Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can give him a round of praise. Praise God. I think we're moving into something. We're moving it in, in layers. It's like, you know, John the Baptist had to come and prepare the way of the Lord, but then the Lord began to come. And I, I just sense there's an expectation and an anticipation that we're just going to keep moving in deeper. Tonight is just laying 
the groundwork for that. And uh, tomorrow is going to be powerful. And I know tomorrow night is going to just be a blowout impartation. So if you can get back here tomorrow night, please uh, make sure you do. We're going to get ready to receive an offering for these meetings. Uh, We're a small church, but we have a big vision. And we serve a big God that's doing big things. And we have a lot of people that have traveled in from other parts of the United States and then also from Mexico and Sweden and other parts of the world. And it takes about $25,000 to pull a weekend off like this. And so God's been faithful and he's always cared for us. I I don't need to manipulate you or twist your arm or twist your hand, but I'm going to ask that you would just be obedient to God and what he tells you to do tonight in an offering. If you want to give, we have about four ways to give. I don't know if we have the giving slide we can put up. You can give on our texting app. Put it up there. You can give through texting. You can give through our website. Or if you would like, you can give through check. You can write it out to CLF or the old-fashioned way, the kind that folds, not the kind that jingles. And you can put it in an offering basket up at the front. So, yeah. we, we, we uh, I've had Mo and I've had less, and I've heard somebody say Mo's better. So we'll take the kind that folds, not the kind that jingles. Praise God. How many are excited about tonight? Can I hear an amen? Yeah. So we, we have a great treat here with us. We have Buck Hudson uh, all the way from Sweden that's going to be ministering the word to us. And so it's been about 10 years since Buck's been with us. And so we just want to put honor on him and just receive the prophetic message that he's going to bring. And we really believe that this is an hour that God's connecting us with what he's going to be doing next. And so if we could, could we just give CLF and all the people that have traveled in a great welcome to Buck Hudson. Would you come, Buck? such an honor to be with you tonight. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Paul, to Kim, to the house. It's amazing, 10 years. All of you look younger. It's amazing. It's just amazing. You know, you haven't you haven't aged at all, you know, except for me and uh, some people on the front row. But, but otherwise, it's really good. Hey, before we get started tonight, can I introduce you to a friend? Is that okay? Would you give me is a fellow from Orlando, Florida. He's he he's the best looking of his brothers. I think he has five brothers. Five brothers. He's the best looking of his brothers. His other brothers are not nearly as looking as good looking as he is. And I I, I his last name is Hen, and it's a very interesting name and a very interesting family. He has brothers that you probably have heard of. But Sam is a fantastic man, and I'm very very grateful. loves people when you're around him. It's sickening. It's just the love oozes out of him. It's just amazing. But is it okay if Sam comes up here and greets you? Could you give give us a come on Sam? <laughs> you know I don't like you. You know, for the longest time, I, I never knew his name was Buck. I, I just didn't know. And then Arizona, I am so grateful to be here. Um, if you've not sat under <clears throat> he's really screwed up my life over the last week because he's been with me and uh, we were in Orlando together and he ministered at our church but we got to spend some time together and uh, I've been in the ministry for 38 years never has my life changed more in 48 hours than in the 48 hours I spent with 
Prophet David Hudson. We've been in a lot of conferences together, and I'm honored to be here tonight. And I'm very, very grateful. Paul, thank you. Thank you for your amazing heart, you and your precious wife, and Tom, Glenn. It's an honor to, uh, to just be here tonight. I, I brought some friends with me, and I love them very. Can I introduce them? Yeah. Brian and Vanita Ford are here. I'm so honored. They're dear, dear friends of mine here in Raleigh, and their friend, my friend Marvin, and Ursula, and Trinity. It's, um, so we're very, very grateful to be here. If you're hungry enough, you won't leave here the same way you came in. Because I don't care how long you've been in it. It doesn't take but one moment, one touch, one word to transform your life forever. And that took place in my life last week when David was with us. When I tell you, you are in, if you've never sat under his ministry, tonight your life will change because of the anointing that rests on his life. And so I thank you. Thank you for the privilege. Yeah, but why are you talking about me? I want you to talk about you. So I'm, um, I'm the most handsome of the boys in the family. There you go. There you go. Benny's a little bit more anointed. At least I tell him that. No, it's, um, it's you know, my mom, my mom touched the world sitting on a chair, never spoke the language, rarely got on a plane. But the one thing she knew was how to touch God in prayer. And everybody sees my brothers and my life and the years that we've spent serving Jesus. But it was one woman on a chair who touched God. And because she touched him, he promised her that her children will serve him. And I'll do that till my last breath. Don't ever underestimate. Don't ever underestimate the power, the transforming power of prayer. Don't wait till Sunday. Don't wait till Wednesday. Take a few minutes every day and ask God, let me be your voice today and watch what he will do because every promise that he's made concerning you will come to pass. And there is power, there is life-changing power in prayer. And I promise you, one moment, just one moment in his presence will change your life forever. I love you, buddy. Give my hand. Can you, can you give that to Paul? Thank you. Thank you. I, I love Sam. He, he's a unique man. He knows everybody. He, he's been a mega church pastor. He, he, he's just so much fun to be around. He's just as real as you can get. Okay. I'm so honored to be with you. Yes, I, I live in Sweden. Yes, God has blessed me. Um, I, I haven't anticipated the things that he would be doing in Europe. It has been unique. Uh, I'm a father to a lot of churches. It's a lot of churches. And I'm working into a lot of different places in the earth right now. But you know what? None of that is important because tonight, tonight, we're here because of what God wants to do with you, with you. And let me begin by saying this, America has lost its voice, but God wants to give it back. No, 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 you don't understand. America has lost its voice, but God wants to give it back. Uh, okay, okay, you know what, you can do better than that. You see. Uh, on, my, on my brand new Apple Watch, there's, there's a meter for, for decibels, and four times in its meeting it says that the sound was so loud that it would cause temporary hearing loss. Okay? So if I say that God is going to give your voice back, you should be. Yeah. 
I think Siri, I think Siri is so flabbergasted she doesn't know what to do right now. Okay, but, okay. How did America lose its voice? How? Well, you can say it's because of the political system. You can say it's because of this president or that president or these elected officials. Part of that is true. Part of that is true. You can't discount that. Part of that is true. But there's a bigger reason why America has lost its voice. And let me, let me just say as it is, I, 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 I am both a European and I am an American. I'm sorry, you're stuck with me. I still have my American passport. But I have a European passport too, so I have the ability to look into different cultures and different situations. Since I've had heart surgery and I've died, I really don't care what I say anymore. I don't care. I feel, like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm becoming more and more like my 88-year-old mother. I mean, it's, 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 it's freaky. She's Scottish. I do not want you to meet her. She will tell you everything I ever did wrong. She will start when I was six years old. I don't want you to meet her. You know, and Tom knows that this is true. It is the truth. It is the truth. So I really don't care. I really don't care exactly what I'm saying. I only care that the king is glorified. I only care, I only care that this nation takes its rightful place in the world. And right now they're not. And you can say, well, again, there's so many things that we have. There's so many movements. There's so many cross currents. There's so many uh, uh, political initiatives that are being taken care of. And this faction wants this and this faction wants that. And you can, you, can, you can say, I'm on the camp of injustice, I'm on, I'm on the camp of, of mega, I'm on, I'm on this and I'm on that. And I just want to say to you, would you please get off of that train? Just get off of that train. Because there's a bigger problem right now why America's lost its voice. And here's what it is. The prophets have forgotten how to speak the word of God. That's what has happened in this nation. The prophets are not speaking clearly the word of God. Now we have prophets here and I know them and they are. But if we talk about the prophets that are within this nation, they're not doing it, honey. They are not doing it. They have been neutered to only give word of knowledge prophecies when they should be talking about what God wants to do in the future. And he's, they should be pointing, they should be pointing people into the principles and the mandate of what God has for each of you and for this nation. So the prophets have lost their voice. They've lost their voice. They've actually come to a place where they're in Ezekiel 13. Ezekiel 13, Ezekiel is talking about the prophets who have missed God and who are prophesying out of their imagination. That's what, he's, that's what it's all about. And he's very, very hard on them because they're saying things that sound good, seem good, from a political standpoint with where Israel is at, and he says that they're leading the people away from the things of God because they are not communicating accurately the things that God has said. Welcome to America. Welcome to America. This is where it's at right now, but God wants to give your voice back. And what this means, what this means is that there's a dysfunctionality in this nation. There's dysfunctionality everywhere. It is. It's everywhere. I, whenever I come to America, the thing that I see, I see the dysfunctionality in the infrastructure. Your roads are getting worse. They're not getting better. Okay, I've never seen so many potholes in my life. I mean, it's amazing. I look at, I look at the buildings. You know, pretty soon your buildings are gonna look like you're in Italy. Because in Italy, they don't paint anything. And the reason why they don't paint anything is because they want the principle that everything looks old and cozy. Let me say to you, America has never been old and cozy. This is the nation of the free and the brave. You're supposed to be leaders in the world. And so God wants to give your voice back, but he also wants to give back things to this nation that will restore it not only to its rightful place in the nation, but 
to the place where each family receives a benefit of finding your voice. So God wants you to find your voice in this world. And what's happened is there's a dysfunctionality that has, because the prophets are not communicating clearly, and yes, yes, I am blaming the prophets. Because the prophets are not communicating clearly the word of God, without a vision, the people perish. Can you say amen? amen? If there is no vision to lead the nation, then where is the nation going to go? And so when you think about these things, this has happened before in Scripture. It has happened before in, in the life of the world. And you hear all of these things about America is like the Roman Empire. It's getting ready to crash. It isn't going to survive. Can I just say that that stuff makes me so mad I want to cuss because it's not true at all. It's just not true, not in any way. But there's a dysfunctionality that is finding itself into your life because of this. And that dysfunctionality basically comes down to agreeing with things, with values and lifestyle that no one in their right mind with common sense would agree with or would do. And so the dysfunctionality that has happened because of losing your voice, the prophets, political leaders who are not receiving the guidance that they need, has found its way into your life. And you are becoming dysfunctional and you don't even know it. But God's going to change that. Let me say it again. God is going to change that. Now, where in the world and where in Scripture can we see things like this? Well, turn with me, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 10 through 13. I am going to talk about prophets tonight, but I want to talk about how God is getting ready to change things. And while you're looking at that Scripture, allow me to be a prophet for, for a minute. I believe... <laughs> I believe that God is sick and tired of word of knowledge prophets and he wants people to go to the throne and get things about the future. Amen. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. Now, wait, a minute. wait, 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 wait. Of the 1,850 prophecies in the Bible, 80% of them are about the future. They're about the Messiah. They're about nations. Amen. I mean, if you look at it closely, the word prophecy means future revelation. That's what it means. And so where in the world did we come up with prophecy is simple encouragement that will bless you. Every prophecy in the Bible that was a real prophecy never had anything to do with blessing you. It was a word to move you. That's what it was. Every prophecy was about moving you forward. And so when you lose your voice, you end up in the camp of Ezekiel chapter 13, and all that you're left with is blessing. God never intended prophets to bless. Prophets are builders. They're supposed to build. They're supposed to be building what God wants to build upon the earth. And so and let me just tell you a couple of things that are happening that you are unaware of. Russia has already detonated two nuclear atom bombs in the ocean. They have. They've done it this last week. They did it. One in the Bering Sea and then one in the Arctic Ocean. They did it. And you know what happened? It didn't work. The detonation failed. It failed. So the bombs didn't go off. Didn't go off. And you know the reason why? It's because there were Bible-believing Christians that were praying that there would be nothing that they could do that would release a strategic nuclear bomb. And so what happened was the technology that would have caused those things to go off failed. And it didn't happen once, it happened twice. Hello, can you say amen to that? Now let me say this, you're going to read about this in the news. I don't know when it's going to come in the news, but it's coming to the news. You're going to read about it. You're going to read about it. And so Russia has failed in the Ukraine. So guess what they're going to do next? They're going to try to annex Belarus. They're going to try to annex it and make it the way that they wanted Ukraine to be. But 
God has a plan. And right now, there's going to be an internal revolution in Belarus that is going to prevent the Russians from doing that. And because God is going to stop the advance of things like this, because it's time for people to find their voice throughout the world. Can you say amen? And so this, this, this thing that I'm speaking about, God is beginning to move upon the nations and upon people's groups who have lost their voice and they're beginning to find it. And so the world is coming to a, pre to a precipice. You know the economic situation and for the next few months, it's gonna be bad. But after that, it's going to be better and better because that's the way it is. The thing about America is that when there is a presidential election, they're gonna start floating money into the economy again to try to make sure that the Democrats are reelected. Okay, that's what they're gonna do. Now, come on. <laughs> this is what they're going to do, okay? But let me just say this to you. As God is giving his voice back to his people, it doesn't matter which one you vote for, God is gonna raise up the right one. Right. Hallelujah. He's gonna vote up the right one, and it's gonna be a righteous one who's gonna stand in his presence, who's not gonna to yield to the bending curves of different political initiatives within this country. It is time to find your voice. Can you say amen? amen. Take your fist like this and say, find it. find it. Now hit somebody and say, find it. This is what God wants to do. And so the nation and the world has lost its voice, but God very carefully is redefining prophets in this world. Let me say it again, he's redefining prophets in this world. Let me say it again, Pro God is redefining prophets in this world. And you know this thing about shopping a prophetic word, would you just get over it? If you get one prophetic word and it's from God, it's gonna change your life and just be happy that you don't get any more because every time I've received a real prophetic word, my life got worse. <laughs> Sorry, Sam, I'm sure you're gonna get prophesied during this meeting. Okay. So here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And let's read verses 10 through 13. When he and his servants arrived at Gibeah, a profession, procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? And after Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Isn't that interesting? The first king of Israel, Samuel the prophet prophesied that he would prophesy, and now is the time that he did it. And he didn't prophesy a simple prophetic thing in a meeting like this, where you come up and you say to the leaders of the meeting, I think I have this, and you submit it. No, 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 no. This was a thing where the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied all night, the whole night. How would you like to prophesy the whole night? And how would you, how would you? <laughs> Everything that comes out of your mouth is right. How about that? Not only do you just prophesy, but everything that you prophesy is right. How many of you would like that experience? I mean, wouldn't that be a cool experience? You know, well, with Saul, here he is. He's prophesying. He's been anointed the king. Here he meets the son of the prophets who are disciples of Samuel. They're worshiping, and the Spirit of God comes upon him really as they're worshiping, like tonight. They're worshiping. Here he is, the chosen one. Now, let me say something about this that's important. Samuel is, or Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. A situation happened a couple of generations before where there was a woman 
who was violated by one of the members of the tribe of Benjamin, the, the people of Israel were so angry that they decimated that tribe and they basically eliminated most of the men. It's a fascinating story where they felt so bad about what they did that they allowed the remaining men of Benjamin to go after and to capture young women so they could take whoever they wanted as their bride and no one could say anything. That's fascinating. Now what's interesting about Saul is he's from the poorest family, from the poorest tribe of Israel. Isn't that interesting? Here's what it means. If you are elected to become king over 12 tribes in a nation and you are from the smallest tribe and your generation was one of those who captured one of those women, don't you think you're going to be a little bit insecure? Don't you think that when you step into the kingship, you're going to have all of that information in your mind and you're going to have to deal with the legacy that has been handed to you. So here he is, prophesied to be the king, but he's incredibly insecure, massively insecure. And so what he does is he prophesies with the prophets and it's glorious. Like Sam said, one touch of the presence of God will change you forever. You would have thought that in this moment when he's prophesying all night, under the power of God and under the leading of the Holy Spirit, everything that is coming out of his mouth is God. You would think that that would radically change him and alter him. But because of his position and because of his insecurity, because of his legacy, he does something in this scripture that is horrific. What he does when he's done prophesying, he gets up and he goes to a high place. High places in those days where people worship God their own way. Hello. There's a lot of people in meetings like this who worship God and are touched by the presence of God, but then they go home and they live life the way that they want. If you're touched by the presence of God, you can't do that. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so the dysfunctionality that happened was his dysfunctionality was transmitted into the nation. And Samuel knew it. Samuel saw it and Samuel confronted it as a true prophet. If you look at the history of Saul, he got clear, very clear instructions to wait to go into battle that Samuel was going to come and he was going to bless them. He refused to do that. So what he did is he put on the priestly garments and he offered up a sacrifice to God. And he acted as both priest and prophet and king. He did that because he was instructed in his own life to create a high place where believing that the presence of God that came upon him when he prophesied was going to be upon him when he did his own thing. Hello? Amen. The problem was is that when he got there and he put everything on, Samuel showed up and said, what have you done? And he didn't even repent. What he did is he made excuses. He said, uh, you weren't here. And people were beginning to leave. So I had to do this. So basically what he was saying to the prophet is, it's your fault that I did this. Now, can I, can I say this about God? God is never late. Even when you think he's late, he still shows up. And it's glory when he shows up. And so it was an aspect of faith and he failed because he had created a high place in his own life. I think in a lot of our American Christian, not here, but in a lot of our American Christianity, there's a lot of Christians who have created their own high place. They love Jesus, but they serve in a capacity like Saul. 
If you're going to find your voice, that dysfunctionality needs to leave. Can I hear an amen? amen. And you might say, but I, 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 I've got so many problems. I'm struggling with my identity. You don't know my life. And you know what? I, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me for saying this. I don't care about your life. I've died three times. How much worse can it get? How much worse can it get? And you might say, you don't know my struggles. You know, I can't pay the light bill. <laughs> Scripture says you're going to get food, you're going to get clothing, and you should be happy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus says. So everything else is just a gift and a blessing. Just a gift and a blessing. So here he is. He put on all of this stuff. He does his own worship of God. Now you had to understand is that he wasn't, he wasn't sacrificing to Baal. He wasn't sacrificing to any of the other gods of the Canaanites. He was sacrificing to Yahweh, our God, who is the Messiah, who is Jesus. He was sacrificing to him, but he was doing it his own way. That dysfunctionality is in America. And it's time for the prophets to find their voice. And it's time for you to find your voice again and to push that away from you. So how do we extend the kingdom in this place? We find our voice again. Let me say it again. We find our voice again. And we roar with one voice. We roar with one voice. We roar in a way where they can hear us all throughout the world because we stand both in the principles, in the life, in the power, in the presence of God, in the holiness and the righteousness of who he is. And we find that prophetic unction upon each of our lives where we can communicate the things of God clear. Now, what's interesting about this, let me just go on just a little bit more. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 18 through 23. We won't read it, I'll just tell you about it. Some years later, there's a young man named David, who you know in the Bible, who Samuel anoints as king. The insecurities of Saul wants to kill this guy because here's a guy who has found his voice, who is going to lead the nation into its most productive time. And he wants to eliminate him. So what he does is he sends three groups of people to kill this guy, three groups of people. Now, it's fascinating when you think about this because each of these groups represents something. They represent the political infrastructure. They represent the priestly inf infrastructure. They also represent the people. And so Saul is taking all the resources that he has and putting it into these soldiers. And we're not talking about a group of five or 10 or 50. We're talking hundreds at each time that are going to find David and to kill him because he has his voice. Let me say this. When you find your voice, the world system is going to try to kill you. They just will. They're going to try to neuter you. They're going to try to stop you. But the Spirit of God is going to prevent all of that. Let me say it again. He's going to prevent all of that. Because what happened in this, first group comes just about to lay their hands on this young man. The Spirit of God falls on them like the same thing that happened to Paul and all the hundreds of those soldiers that are going to take him prophesy. Hallelujah. And they didn't prophesy one time. They prophesied the whole night. Praise God. How would you like it to see the armies of the United States prophesy under the anointing and the power of God? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Well, the army of Israel, Saul's army. Oh, I love God. The Spirit of God comes upon them when they're getting ready to take this young man. 
and the presence of God comes so strong, they're prophesying all together, all of them, individually, prophesying the things of God and the things over the nation. Now remember I said that prophecy is futuristic. So they're prophesying. I wish we had it all recorded. But let's say there's 300, 500. They're all prophesying the whole night. The whole night. Now if you're prophesying the whole night under the glory of God, let me say this. Most of us can only stand in a real Holy Ghost meeting with the power of God. We're knocked out and we're overwhelmed by that power of God, maybe four to six hours at the most, and then we're glory fried for the next 10 days. <laughs> and here are these guys, they're prophesying the whole night long, hundreds of them under the power of God. Do you think they were incapacitated the next day? You better believe they were. So they forgot about getting him because they had a spiritual migraine. <laughs> they were overwhelmed with the presence of God. They, they had to go back and say to Saul, why didn't you get this guy? Well, you see, we just about had him. And then the presence of God came and it showed up and we all prophesied the whole night. Now, what do you think Saul is thinking about? The insecure one, the leader of the nation the one who prophesied, the one who has his own worship, his own high place. So what does he do? Well, let's find out if this is really real. So he sends out a second group. Hallelujah. Just as many men, just about ready to grab him. Guess what happens? The Spirit of God falls upon all of them. They prophesy the whole night. Can you say amen? Amen. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Second army. Now you have to understand, these are guys in full military regalia. They got full armor on. They got spears. They got bows. They got crossbows. They got swords. They got everything. They got enough equipment on them that probably is 80 pounds each soldier has to carry, plus their foods and their rations. And here they are marching, and the Spirit of God falls on them, and they're prophesying a whole night. A whole night. The second army army. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So what does Saul do when he hears about this? He sends out a third army. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is amazing. So you see, it's the political system. It's the priestly system. It's the dysfunctionality of the people in the nation. So here he is. He's sending all of this out to David to kill him. But God had a plan. And so for the third time, he comes upon the third army and they prophesy all night. May this happen in America, hallelujah. Let me say it again, may this happen in America. Let me say it again, may this happen in America. May the anointing that was upon the Pilgrim Fathers and on the Great Awakening, may it live again within this nation. And may the presence of God fall upon our armies. Yes. May it fall upon the Senate. Yes. May it fall upon Congress, the House of Representatives. Yes. May it fall upon the state representatives and the senators of this great state. May it fall upon the churches and may it fall upon the families of this great, great nation. Can you say amen to that? Amen. God wants his people to prophesy. He wants his people to find their voice. He wants us to shake ourselves, our dysfunctionality, and to move forward into all that he has for each of us. Finding your voice means that you have to put some things aside. You cannot come to a place in your own private devotions where you're worshiping God in your own way that has nothing to do with who he is or how he is. It basically means you have to put compromise away. Things got very quiet. So here's the next thing that happened. Saul says, hey, these men are not men enough. I'm going to go get this guy. So here he is in his full armor, his full armor, 
probably with the biggest, biggest army that he had. And he hears that David and Samuel at, are at Naoth. And so he has a plan to get him and to trap him. So he comes to the place where they're at. And what's interesting, what the Bible infers is this. Samuel allows the army and Saul to come into his presence and to stand before him. And David is standing right next to him. Now think about that. Think about that. The others were on the other way. The Spirit of God falls. They prophesy. Now the king, his army, is right before Samuel, ready to lay hands on David. And just at that moment, the Spirit of God falls on all of them. And the Bible says that it fell on Samuel, on Saul, so strong that he took off his bat battle armor. He was there to kill David. He took off his battle armor and he stripped himself and laid naked before Samuel and before the Lord for a day and a night. What in the world does that mean? It means that anyone who resists what God wants to do is going to be stripped of their positions. Those who are building things that are not what he wants to build upon the earth, he's going to deal with it. And then you'll have no choice but to come before him naked, who you are and for the presence of God to touch you. So God stripped this leader. But the interesting thing about when you're stripped as a leader, I know about this personally, when you're stripped as a leader, when the presence of God comes that strongly upon you, when it comes that strongly upon you, like it did Saul, it's a second chance. Yes. Let me say it again. It's a second chance. And it wasn't a second chance for him. It was a third chance. It came upon him not just for a day. It came upon him for a day and a night. In other words, it was on him for 36 hours. Wait, 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 wait. Fathom that. Come on. Fathom that. Prophesying nonstop continually under a glory-frying anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit for 36 hours, for 36 hours, for 36 hours. His men saw him stripped. David is only about 20 feet away from him. Samuel is sitting in his chair right before him. I imagine they're all prophesying. He couldn't get him. He couldn't reach him. God gave him a second chance. He knew what the presence of God was. He knew it, he knew it, he knew it, he knew it. How many of you know what the presence of God is? He knew it, he knew it, he lived under it. He knew it. And when it wasn't upon him, he would ask musicians come to try to create the atmosphere so that the presence of God could come. But because of his dysfunctionality, and I'm, I'm actually talking about this nation, because of his dysfunctionality, he couldn't access the presence of God even in worship. He remembered the time when he was with the sons of the prophet and they were singing and the presence of God came. He remembered when the presence of God came where he was in the presence of Samuel. He remembered that. He remembered that. And now in his insecurity, and now in his own worship, his own way, God wanted to give him a third chance. So he did. Samuel gave him basically a command, go eliminate these people and kill their king. And he refused to do it. That was it. So what is the thing that determines your dysfunctionality? Listen to this very carefully. Obedience. Look at your neighbor and say, obedience. obedience. That determines your dysfunctionality. If you will obey, if you will obey. 
He refused to obey when he had very, very clear prophetic instructions. Very, very clear direction. He knew it. He understood it. But he was still the man who went to the high place and did his own thing. And so when Samuel confronts him about why didn't you kill Agog, he does the same thing again. Well, you know, we killed so much. Yeah, we took some of their stuff, but you know, we deserve that. We worked so hard for it. When God gave specific instructions, kill them all, don't take anything. So it was worshiping God, their God, their way. And God was saying to the nation, you can't do it your way, you have to do it my way. So the dysfunctionality happens through disobedience. And where did the dysfunctionality happen in America? Where? You can say, well, it happened when we elected this president or we put in this elected official. Partly true. But it actually happened when the prophets lost their voice. That's when it happened. And how do I know they lost their voice? They stopped prophesying about the future correctly. And in a meeting like this, they'll read a word of knowledge and they'll read your mail and they'll read who you are. And they'll give you a word about your mandate. Oh, you're an apostle. Oh, you're a prophet. Oh, you're a helps ministry. Oh, you, you're, you're a businessman. You're going to be blessed. That's all mandate prophecies. Even a donkey can prophesy that. But prophets prophesy about the future because they hear God. And they say only what he says. Let me say it again. They say only what he says. So let me just, as I'm winding up, let me just say this. And this is very important. The world is weak because the prophets are not in place. They're not in place. And I want to say to you, to this church and to the people and to the nations that are here, you put something back in place. Don't make the prophetic or prophets an accessory in your church because they were never intended to be accessories. When you make them an accessory, you've lost your voice. They should be building alongside of the apostles. They should be giving direction and guidance and counsel. In fact, if you look at the Bible, let me just do this very quickly. In the Bible, prophets were permitted to hear the deliberations and the decisions of God's court, and they have the privilege of speaking in God's counsel. So they just don't hear from heaven, they speak into heaven. All right, now wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Did you just hear what I said? So we get this thing where it's like, okay, prophets are supposed to get a word from me, but the Bible says that prophets not only speak God's word, but they also hear what heaven is saying. They are into the conversations of the counsel of God. They hear it and they speak into that heavenly counsel. Hello? Yeah. Have you ever heard any prophets do that? You see, that's what we're missing. So you got all this garbage with prophets who are prophesying gloom and doom and prophesying end of the world, <sighs> prophesying mag and magog and antichrist. Can, can I just say this? Forgive me for saying this this way. In, in the, the only person who talks about Antichrist is John the Apostle. He talks about it five times. Four times he talks about it as the spirit of Antichrist, which is trying to make you dysfunctional. Only one time did he talk about a person. Only once. Jesus never talked about the Antichrist. Never. Paul never talked about the Antichrist. He talked about lawlessness but he didn't talk about an antichrist. 
So where in the world do we get all of this hyped up nonsense garbage? Okay, the earth is the Lord in the fullness thereof, hallelujah. It all belongs to him. So he can determine what he wants to do with all of it. But you have all of these guys that are going around for money, going around for sensationalism, going around because the crowd will listen to what they say. That's Ezekiel 13. It's time for the prophets and for the nation to find their voice and to clearly say what God wants to do and build what he wants to build upon the earth. And it's time for us to wash that dysfunctionality out of our lives. No more compromise. Don't compromise with what you think. Oh, I can get away with this. No, you can't get away with this. You'll lose your voice. And if you lose your voice, you lose your family. Think about that. The Lord reveals his plans to prophets, and he also considers their input. In the Bible, a prophet functions as a prosecutor, delivering the Lord's indictments, and he also functions as an advocate for the defense, pleading with Yahweh to keep his promises. Moses did that. Prophets who speak God's word create new worlds. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time for a new world. How many of you are ready for a new world? No, no, no. How many of you are ready for a new world? The Bible is a book about prophecy. The Bible is a book about prophecy. The promise of resurrection is, is a prophecy. The promise of New Jerusalem is a prophecy. It's all prophecy. All of that is new worlds. It's new worlds. It's things that we're all going to see and it's all going to happen. It's all prophecy. It's in the book. It's in the book. It's in the book. It's there. But prophecy creates new worlds. It's supposed to. Prophets are supposed to create new worlds. Where in the world do we get this nonsense that prophets are an accessory gift that is supposed to bless us? Now, I know what 1 Corinthians 14 says about it. It's supposed to be encouragement. It's supposed to be uh, edification. It's supposed to bring comfort. Okay, let me say this very carefully. If you look at that, the first part of 1 Corinthians 14, it's actually talking about the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy you can function in. You can function in that. The Bible says you may all prophesy. Can I hear an amen? But then it also says that when the, when the prophets speak and there's a revelation, the others need to sit down and they need to judge it. They need to review it. So what are they judging? They're, they are judging the accuracy of the word concerning the future. Because that's what it was. That's what it was. And so <sighs> prophets are supposed to be involved in creating new worlds, not in blessing. The gift of prophecy people, you can bring direction, you can bring specific things. Hallelujah, and please do. You can bring blessing after blessing after blessing. But prophets are supposed to reveal the mind of God to the world. And with that, they should be creating new worlds. So tonight, in this dysfunctionality, it's time to restore the prophets back to the right place. And it's time to restore them into the right place in America. And you might say, but... Are you taking away something from the apostles? No, I'm not. I'm not at all. They're in harness together. But the right leg is strong and the left leg is weak. It's time to bring us, bring us into a right place where we can both stand together, the apostolic and the prophetic in the right place. So kings build sanctuaries, priests serve in them, prophets provide the blueprint for the sanctuary. Moses delivered the plans for the tabernacle. David saw the pattern of the temple. Ezekiel was given a vision of the future temple. Given that sanctuaries were world models, the prophets were given the pattern to create new worlds. Think about that. From the very beginning in scripture, they were always involved in creating a new world. All of this. The temple would have never been built if it wasn't involved with prophets that are involved. The church would have never happened if it was not prophesied into existence. Your salvation 
would never have happened if it wasn't prophesied into existence. All of this is built upon prophecy. All of it. Every single bit of it. You're here in this meeting and experience the presence of God. It was prophesied that you will all prophesy, that you will all have a deposit of the Spirit of God upon your life. It's all built on prophecy. It's all a new world. So why in the world do we allow the dysfunctionality of the devil to take away from us what is ours? It's time to get it back. It's time to get it back. So prophets just don't predict the future. They shape it. They shape it. Now, I'm very well what the prophets did when they were prophesying over a certain president. And you can say, well, they got it right, they got it wrong. Who cares? What should have happened, heaven should have spoken clearly. And somehow, they didn't access it. Because if God says, it happens. Now, listen to me very carefully when I say this. If an Ephesians 4 prophet, if we go to the Old Testament and the Bible is continuous, I don't believe in dispensations, I believe in the Bible. Now I understand that Jesus has fulfilled many things in the Old Testament, but the Word of God is eternal, it is forever. Can we say amen to that? Amen. So in the Old Testament, it was said that if a prophet prophesies wrongly about the future, kill him. How many of you have read that in the Bible? No, no, no. How many of you read that in the Bible? Don't you think that's the standard that we should have now? And you might say, well, that's not grace and love and mercy. Not for prophets, it's not. If you speak in the name of the Lord... If you speak and believing that what you hear is his, it has to come to pass. And if it doesn't come to pass, this is your measuring rod. So I think a whole lot of prophets should retire. Hello? And we should be raising up those who find their voice. And you might say, I will never prophesy again. <laughs> oh, yes, you will. <laughs> oh, yes, you will. <laughs> Just remember the hundreds and thousands that Saul sent to take David, the anointed. They all prophesied. <laughs> they all prophesied. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. If you belong to him, this is part of the package. And you might say, but I don't want to do that. Well, that's up to you. But you can. It's like, I don't want to speak in tongues. I don't care. You can. There are certain things in the Bible that I know that are there, but I don't want to do. I don't care. They're there. But that's dysfunctionality. And God wants to eradicate that out of your life. Prophets become prophets for only one reason. Only one reason. God sends them and he gives them little choice. So you know how I got to Europe? I'll tell you and then I'll wind down. This is how I got to Europe. I was preaching in the African-American churches in Chicago. I loved it. I was the only white boy. I was, forgive me for saying this, I was the cracker, you know. 400, 600, I was preaching in several of these African-American churches in, in Chicago, Gary, Indiana, Indianapolis, and other places, and it was wonderful. You know, when a white boy hits a vein and he preaches just a little, and you know, white, white boys have a little problem with preaching unless they really learn how to do it. 
Come on, black folk, you know that, okay? Okay, okay, okay. Look, I've been to Africa. I've preached in front of 100,000 people. Let me tell you something. When the Spirit of God falls upon you wonderful black folk, you know how to dance. Okay, when, when the Spirit of God falls upon us white people, we only know one thing, and it's pogo. And you know, for the youth, they do headbang, okay? So it's pogo and headbang, headbang. That's the only two things. But if you go to South America, if you go to Africa, those people dance under the power of God. They move under the power of God. It's amazing. So here I am preaching in these beautiful, beautiful churches with these incredible guys. And when you preach, you hit a vein, people come and throw money at you. Hallelujah. <laughs> No, let me tell you, let me tell you, okay, 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 I'm a hippie, okay, I didn't, I didn't know this, you know, in, in Kirksville, back in the days, we took up an offering, it barely paid the light bill, okay, so here I am in an African-American church, and I'm doing the best I can in preaching, and people are not coming up and laying envelopes, they're coming up and they're throwing money on my feet, and they're saying, go white boy, go. <laughs> Now let me say, that's, that's motivation. <laughs> and then I don't care what I'm preaching. And so when you get more excited, they don't care what you're preaching either. They just, they just want to see you go. And so, you know what? I preach my heart out. They, they, they just throw money. They throw money. And so I, I'm sweating. I'm drenched. Everything is wet. And so the mother of this church, you know, in these, these Kojic churches, there's, there's a church mother. They're, they're wonderful. She's got a big hat on. I mean, she's lovely. She's wonderful. She comes up to me. You know, everybody is slapping me on the back, and they're so happy. She comes up to me, and this is what she says. Well, white boy, we sure love that calm preaching. I said, look at me. I'm soaked. And she said, well, if you were really anointed, you, you have to put on two different coats. <laughs> and I said, mother, the next time I come, I'll bring an extra coat. And so the next time I came, I brought two extra coats. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was wonderful. So I'm in a church on the, west, on the west side of Chicago. A prophet comes up to me, and he says this. He points his finger at me. And he says this, didn't know me, he prophesied this, the time is going to come, you're going to look like a Swede, act like a Swede, and smell like a Swede. <laughs> and I thought, uh, I'm sure that wasn't from God. <laughs> because I want, I want more of this. So six months later, on the, on the south side of Chicago, a man I never met, never met, beautiful, beautiful senior prophet. He had to be over 80. He comes up to me in the middle of the meeting. In the middle of the meeting, he comes up to me, and he stands about 10 feet away from me. He takes his crooked finger, and he says this, do you remember the story of Jonah and the whale? You don't think I can create a whale to swallow you on dry land, but I can. I told you to go. Two weeks later, I was in Sweden. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's called obedience. It's called obedience. So tonight, extending the kingdom, find your voice. It's time to find your voice again. Everybody just stand up. It's time to find your voice again. Can I have the musicians come? It's time to find your voice again. It's time to shake ourselves from the dysfunctionality. There's dysfunctionality in the political system. There's dysfunctionality in the financial system. There's dysfunctionality. 
I mean, just, just, just look at reality TV. No, please don't look at reality TV. It's just so dysfunctional. You know, I was sitting with a group of Danes, and one of them turned on a reality TV show. I don't even remember what it was. And they just looked at me and they said, are all Americans like this? And I just had to look at them and I said, no. And they say, but why is every social media program like this? And I said, it's a dysfunctional society. And they said, and we're sending our kids to your colleges. And they're coming back dysfunctional. There's a place in California that we've sent a lot of kids to, and we get them back, they're all dysfunctional. And we have to deprogram them. We send them to another place, other seminaries, we get them back, they're dysfunctional. And when they come home, and they come back in to a Nordic culture, we have our own dysfunctionality. They come back into a Nordic culture, then they basically say, we don't want to live there again. We're glad to be home. And I say, you don't know these people. You don't know how wonderful they are. Come with me and I'll show you the real America. The America who's finding its voice. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So tonight, here's the altar call. God wants you to find your voice again. He wants you to find it in the presence of God and he doesn't want you to build your own high place. He doesn't want you to make excuses for the way things have happened. He doesn't want you to push, to push away uh, who he is and to take hold of things that are compromising your life and you know it. So extending the kingdom means finding your voice. And if tonight you will say, I'm going to find my voice and I'm going to push away dysfunctionality, I want you to come forward right now. Just 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 come forward. Push forward. Come on, quickly. Come to the front. 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 That's it. That's it. That's it. And can I ask for Tom and Paul and Pat to come to the platform, please? Just lift your hands before the Lord. I think it's time for some of the prophets and the evangelists to begin to pray and to release this dysfunctionality out of our life and for us to find our voice again. So everybody just begin to speak in tongues right now. Come on. Just keep praying here. Just keep praying. Just let the Spirit of God stir inside of you. Stir in us.
sometimes we have to wait on God for our own voice to become quiet so his voice can become loud. Our own human voice being replaced by his voice. It's the prayer that uh, Brother Hinn was speaking about earlier. We're doing it right now. We're letting his voice become stronger than our voice. What's going on in this moment It's not just that wrong prophetic grace is being corrected. It's more than that. It's being replaced by a righteous spirit of prophecy, by a righteous culture of prophetic people. And what's interesting about the story he read isn't just that Samuel prophesied as a prophet or saw, but the the whole army did. Everyone fell under it, and it began to make something right. You may be sitting here tonight saying, well, I'm not a a prophet like Samuel was or like David Hudson is. But you're in that army. You're You're in that people. You're in that group. And the same spirit of prophecy that was falling upon the leaders fell on everybody. Because it wasn't just that a man needed to find his voice, a people needed to find their voice. And that's why they all prophesied together. And tonight, the dysfunctions in our lives that would make us lose our voice or make it diminished. There's a real surrender at this altar. We're not just coming to be empowered, but we're coming to lay something down. Saul had to be stripped of the things that caused him to fight against the spirit of prophecy until he could come under it. And if there's people in this altar tonight that say, I want to come back under that anointing, I want to come back back under that spirit of prophetic, righteous ability. Right now, be willing to let things that don't belong be stripped away. If you're a father and there's things that are dysfunctional in your dysfunctional in your house, you need to find your voice again. If you're a mother, if you're a business owner and there's you you have an, a, a business and you've lost your voice in it, right now surrender the things and be stripped of the things that you know what they are Let the Spirit of God speak to you and say, this is going to come down. I'm surrendering right now in the presence of God. If you're a student and you're in a university and you have lost your voice, it's time for you to find it again and begin to prophesy to your generation. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It's time for the voice to come back to you in your generation. If you work somewhere in a a business and you're there with the other employees, it's time for you to find your voice. If you work in an institution or education, all these places need us, need you to find your voice. Father, right here in your presence, we become undone. We begin to lay down all the other armor we have trusted in that we thought our image was a voice. There are people in this room right now where you are losing the idea that image is voice. I'd rather have the voice of God in my heart and not be important in the eyes of man, but be used by God to shake cities and shake regions and neighborhoods rather than trying to become famous. Image is not always voice. Voice is is when heaven speaks and power falls and things change. Beware when all men speak well. Right here, right here in his presence, everything that has robbed your voice, if you know what it is, right here in the presence of God, we surrender it. We surrender it and we take it off. What have we trusted in? Any compromise we have had right now in the presence of God, we lay it down. Any distractions we have had that it caused us to lose our voice, we lay it down. Right here in the presence of God, if you know what that is, begin to surrender it. I lay down whatever that is to you. I lay it down and I become undone in the presence of God so that I could find my voice again. There are leaders in this altar call right now. God wants to give your voice back. The things we've looked for to find our voice in God's saying, don't look there, look to Him. Every insecurity, every insecurity, every fear of man, 
preaches the gospel, every fear of man will kill your voice. Fear of man will kill your voice. Right here, Lord, we surrender it. There are cities waiting for you. Joey Hancock, God has given you your voice. He has given you voice. He's given you your voice. In the presence of God, you are, you are stripping down. You are letting things go. Man of God, you are letting it go. You are stripping down tonight in the presence of God so that the voice of heaven can enter into you. Tim Hilton, God's given you your voice. Over this young man, strip down, Lord, the things that would cause him to not hear it, to not walk in it. Authority is entering you, man of God. I get to see it falling upon leaders right now. This brother from Minnesota, is uh, the, the, the Latino brother right here, God has given you your voice. Lord, let it enter him. It's falling on you like fire. It's coming in lots of different forms. The brothers that have the arts, uh, poema, I think it is, that, that God has given you your voice, sir. It's going to come out in the arts. It's going to come out through all the things you're doing, but it's a prophetic voice. All those plays and all the things you're doing, it's, you're finding your voice. It's moving all over this room right here. Begin to look for God. Let the stuff come down. Let the stuff come down that's in the way of, of being a righteous prophetic movement. We're letting go of man's arguments. We're letting go of dysfunctions. We're letting go of what our mama said or our daddy said that put us in a pen. What some other preacher that didn't know God said. Right now, we begin to be free of it in the name of Jesus, and we begin to find the presence of God. Angel Woodard, find your voice. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of prophecy come upon you. May you find your voice, woman of God. It's like fire is beginning to enter into you right now. More than an administrator. More than an administrator. More than an administrator. You're finding your voice. The Spirit of God is moving on you. For another moment, cry out to God. Here's the cry, Lord, let me find my voice. I just feel a godly jealousy for all of you. All of us could lay down and prophesy all night like they did. It would tear this town apart. Devils would be on the run. The testimony of Jesus would be strong, so strong they wouldn't know what to do. Lord, let it happen tonight. Let something be birthed in this place. Eddie Morton, find your voice. Man of God, man of God, find your voice. I hear the Lord telling me to tell you this. Find your voice. Eddie, cry out to God right now. You're supposed to roar like a lion in these parts. There is so much warfare against you, man of God. Right here, we need to believe God for this man. We need to believe God for this man. You're supposed to roar like a lion. You're supposed to roar. If you'd find your voice, thousands of people would come into the kingdom of God. This is the manner of man you're called to be. Everything that's in your way, let go of every Saul armor, every Saul army, let it go tonight. Paul, I feel like in, I feel like in this church, God, God is baptizing people in something. Come on, Tucson, finding your voice. The Tucson church, begin to cry out to God. There's a voice for you to have in Tucson, Arizona. Pat Forbes, find your voice. Pat, just lift your hands. Right here in the name of Jesus, the Spirit of God falling upon you. Every Saul, every Saul armor, every armor of Saul, even if it sounds good, Pat, you've come to a point of brokenness in your life where you're willing to let it all go to find God. You're willing to lay down, strip down if you have to, if that's what it takes. Father, I thank you that Mankato has a voice, that there's a voice of the Spirit of God in that place. Pat, God is choosing you. You keep looking for another, but right now, man of God, it's you. Find your voice. 
Can you all pray in the Spirit just for a few more minutes? Let this stir in us. Let this stir in us. Cry out to God for it. Reach into the atmosphere and say, God, baptize me in it. In the name of Jesus. Just let it stir. All you young people, bless you for listening to your fathers. But you have a voice. In your generation, serve the purposes of God in your generation. Let His voice be in you. A baptism of His voice tonight. It's like tongues of fire coming upon us tonight. In the name of Jesus, we're finding our voice. Every unbelief and every doubt that we can have that, right now we surrender it in the presence of God. Every doubt and every unbelief, we surrender it in the presence of God. Every doubt and every unbelief, we surrender it in the presence of God to find the voice of God that's ours to carry, that's ours to live in. Lord, let the tongue of fire come upon every life in the name of Jesus. Right here in the name of Jesus, in this man, Lord, let the baptism of the voice of God begin to fall upon his life. Fire burning in your bones tonight in the name of Jesus. Fire falling upon you. Baptize him, oh God, in the voice of heaven. Your life is getting ready to change, sir. Your life is getting ready to change in every way to make room for the voice of God in your heart and who you're going to be. The Lord says, I'm going to rearrange everything. I'm going to rearrange everything to get you in position, to line you up for your voice to be heard. John Robinson, find your voice. Man of God, cry out to God right here. Come on, come on. Find it, find it. Just for a few more moments, don't, don't give up on this. Don't, don't stop, keep pressing in. He didn't come all the way here just to preach a good message. He came to deliver something into you. The spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus coming to replace the words of men and the culture of man, the culture of the kingdom of God in a righteous prophetic church, overtaking lies of hell, Father, baptize us in your voice. Impartation's the voice. It's his voice. It's not our voice. It's not the prophet's voice. It's God's voice in you. Right here, just draw near to him one more time. Don't say, I'm too young. Don't say, I'm too this or that. I'm too underprivileged. I don't come from the right pedigree. 
you're a woman, don't say, I'm well, I'm a woman. If you're a child, don't say, I'm just a kid. If you're an older person, don't say, I'm too old. Don't say that. God's not a respecter of persons. Tonight, he wants this whole group to be baptized in his voice. We're so used to looking at a man. God wants him to be in a people. God wants him to be in a people. side of your generation. You're prophesying to them already. You're a young David. You're a young David. The Spirit of God's falling upon you right now, son. That weight that's coming upon you. It's His power in you. You're finding it. Your voice, I'm saying to you on the other side of this conference, you're going to begin to blast your city like a trumpet. You're going to last like a trumpet. It's falling on you right there. The voice is entering you. Those that are around him, you can see it. It's moving into him. It's like fire going into you. Burn in him, God. Father, we thank you for his young, precious life. Sherry uh, Alamang, lift your hands in the presence of God. You don't think you deserve this. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, girl. The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable and without repentance. You think so many times, God, can I ever really do it? Can I ever really do it? But the Spirit of God's falling upon you. The Spirit of prophecy is entering you. You were born for it. You were born for it! I'm like breaking a curse over you. You were born. not look back. Look forward. Look forward, Sherry. Right, one, one more time, right now, the Spirit of the Lord falling on you right there, right there, like a weight, like fire coming upon you. There it is. It's just setting on you. We don't have to touch her. It's coming upon her from heaven. Sherry, let that fall all the way on you. Kirksville's getting ready to find out what it's about. You're going to prophesy. You're going to prophesy. to that realm. We're finding our voice. I don't think the Lord's done here. Sometimes we want things to be one, two, three in a meeting. We have to wait on the Lord for a moment. This girl's all the way from my home. And Lydia, the Spirit of God's falling on you. You get This thing we talked about today about helping young women you're finding your voice. It's not Mark's voice. It's not my mom's voice. It's not my voice. In Fresno, it's your voice. You've been waiting for the moment, for the door to open, to give what you really have. Lord, this is what I have. And until we have the moment, you haven't known what to do, but I'm saying to you right now, as you're even taking this girl into your home, you're finding your voice. Your voice is beginning to come alive. It just energy right there. You're, you're going to go home begin to declare it. Can we, just, can we just cry out to God just for a few more moments? It's like God's just weaving in and out of this altar. The Spirit of the Lord, breathing. <laughs> Jessica, just, Jess, lift your hands. Jeff, lift your hands. That's Jessica, right? Lift your hands. Oh, my God, for the poor and needy. For the poor and needy. I hear the Lord saying he's getting ready to elevate your voice. Everyone, right now, you need to believe God for this woman in the area of the poor and needy. He's elevating your voice. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of prophecy is coming upon you. And you're going to begin to speak to the city of Raleigh. Not just the inhabitants, but the government of it some capacity, the city council, these kind of people, there's going to become interaction in the day ahead. Prophecy is going to declare the way things will be. 
Lord, I thank you right now that you are opening the door that no man can shut. Lord, that this prophetic voice to the poor and needy is falling upon her. in here tonight, I, you know, it's like a target on you, you know, guy, and God's looking for you. This message is for you tonight, that you need to find your voice. It's like the devil came and he tried to drown you. He, got, he didn't want your voice, and it was starting to raise too loud, and he came and he, tried, he attempted to drown you and snuff you out. Of course he couldn't. Sometimes you feel like your voice is diminished. Sing, Lord, I want to find it again. I want to find it again. So God's coming back to give you your voice, except this time it won't look like, and this is very important, like it did before. It's not going to be, it's not going to be on Charisma Magazine. It's not going to be entertained on social media. It's not going to be. you go unnoticed. You sing, I'm willing just to be humble. Just let it happen. God will gather around you sons and daughters that will carry this voice of God and the extension will be far beyond your life. And so the second chance, it's like when he was saying another chance, it's like, it's like when he was prophesying that, it's like God is coming to give you another round. He's coming soon to give you another round of finding your voice. There's going to be such an impartation into those around you. Sometimes you'll think, my God, nothing can stop this. And I feel like as we lay hands on you tonight, not only is your voice being reawakened to this nation and to other nations, but so is your mantle. is going to come alive with fire. And the death that you've died and the altar you've laid at and wept at for years is like soaked that mantle with, with gasoline. It's like it's just, it's dripping with weeping. But when God lights it on fire, Sam, <laughs> brother, there'll be no stopping you. It's going to happen. something about the way you started this meeting talking about your mother it was the launch of everything that happened here tonight because there was one woman that was willing to hear the voice of God to set things in motion in the earth and Sam this is a moment in your life where you're not being restored to what you've been but the voice of God is coming to you now in a way not to send you back into the past but to send you into the future and what you've touched doesn't compare to the things that lie ahead. When you hear his voice and you obey it. And I hear the Lord saying, I'm coming even more to separate you from what has been so that I can fully move you into the future. And there are going to be relationships that you will feel separated and estranged from. But know this, my hand is upon that, says the Spirit of the Lord. For I'm separating you unto myself so that you can hear my voice and the commission that's going to come is going to be different than anything that you've ever lived in, says the Lord. 
And I hear the Lord saying, I am even now drawing new people around your life. People of purity of heart and devotion that only want that which is right. And I hear the Lord saying, you'll take the stories of the old and bring them into the new. You'll bring the pain of the past and bring it into the future. But you won't look the same because you've heard my voice. You'll be somebody completely different. So hear this, son. My voice is about to thunder. It's about to thunder into your very being. And it's going to burn like fire in your soul. And it's going to separate you from what has been to fully put you into the future. He's separating you unto himself even more right now in the presence of God. In this day, it is a type of a new day. God has you in that city that's gone far away from Him. It's a city that's, that seems to be something like a Sodom and a Gomorrah. That this city is, has seen so many awesome things, but it's turned away from God. And then there's you. A man that knows the pain of brokenness. Then there's you, a man that knows what redemption is about. And then there's you, a man that's been renewed and his feet have been placed upon the solid rock again. He's being built up to represent a generation of broken people that's being called out of something into something, that's being called out of darkness into light. And I see a brand new, if you will, anointing to take a city, to take a people out of the wandering of the desert into a promised land of God. There's people that are going to be looking to you because they wandered and they wandered and they wandered and they can't seem to find a place. And then there's you. And I believe God is saying he's chosen you for such a time as this. I know we, we hear that, but when I see you, I see a man that's going to bring hope to the hopeless. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, just place my hands upon him. I just sense God wants to see you be a liberator. See you be the kind of man that reaches down into the depths and pulls out gems and jewels. It's like you'll look at something that other men will walk away from or walk around and you'll see into people's lives. People will find delight in being with you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we proclaim this day. If I could say this man has been holy in your sight, set apart for this day to do a new work in a new way. We just thank you, God. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name. Highways and byways. This man's going to jump over fences that other people have built. This man is, is not a, a domesticated, if I could say, domesticated goose, but he's going to got wings that's going to fly. He's got wings that's going to mount up and go high. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Brother, we're 
we're not done here yet. The restoration of your voice to your children and your family is what's coming next. There's been a great war against the thought. I see a daughter that has a strong ability, strong. But there's some kind of conflict with your voice, her hearing your voice. And her voice won't be right. She has a voice in her own she wants to go with it but because she shut her ears to your voice it's caused something to not be right in hers she doesn't know it yet but there's a uh, strong gift in her that has to be joined to you the Malachi thing fathers and, and sons and daughters have to be united and you look at her and you think she's anointed but the disconnect from the power of the voice in your life for her doesn't help her. And hear the Lord saying, I am coming to heal the breach. And your voice will be in her life again. She will hear it. And you will hear, hear hers. And the, uh, the unity that you've desired that has been harder to come by change when your voice is heard. The devil would try to tell you, oh, you have no voice here. Yes, you do. Your children are going to hear your voice. Father, right here, the baptism of the voice of the Father to his children, especially this girl I keep seeing. Lord, their voice must become one voice, not multi, not not separate directions. Somehow she's a legacy carrier for you. Lord, I think that there's going to be a oneness in the voice. In the name of Jesus. You're going to know this is real because she's going to say, I'm sorry for the measurements she put upon you and your voice. When you hear her say that, it's a sign to you that the voices are lining up. This is going to happen. Praise God. You're coming into a season of restoration. It isn't just with family. It's also beyond. For those who have hated you will come to you and will embrace you. And then you have a decision to make. I'm going to give you back something that you haven't anticipated nor have you wanted. I'm going to lay it into your hands and you're going to know what to do with it. And it will affect hundreds and then thousands of people. It's not a message. I've already given you that. I'll give you building. I'll give you the position. And you will become a counselor to your brothers. And in many ways, they don't see you as the way that I see you. But the day is coming when you will be more than a consultant. You will lead them, and you will strengthen them, and you will help them. Some of them, I want to say this very carefully, some of them have a short time upon this earth, and you need to prepare your heart. But in the days that come, you will strengthen your brothers, and you will help them to go forward, and they will see you in a different light. Favor is over your life, but in the most unique ways. It's not just about finances, but it's about position and influence. If you keep the heart of a shepherd, I'm going to put a staff back into your hand, and I will lead you in the right way and in the right place, and you will not be in one city. You will be in three the third is yet to be revealed, but when it comes, you will know it.
And the question is, how will I be able to do these things? At that time, I will show you. I'm rewriting your name, Samuel. One who hears God. And the spirit of prophecy will come upon you again and again. And when you are around the prophets, you will prophesy like one of them. For it is your legacy, it is your inheritance. You have always seen yourself as a pastor, but you are more than that. And so I am marrying, says the Lord, the pastor to the prophet, and the prophets will come to you, and you will know what to do with them. You'll knock them in the head, and then you'll love them into place. And the Spirit of God is coming upon you, Open up your heart. This meeting, this grace, all of this is coming upon you. Open up your heart. These things will surely come to pass. And here comes the presence of God. And here it is. Now. That's it. Now. And there he is. Now. Yes, 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 yes. It's getting stronger. New world. Everybody shout new world. New world. Say it one more time. New world. Say it one more time. New world. There he is now. That's him. That's him. That's him. New world is being created in you, Sam. A new world. Can we give God a hand? I just want to say one more thing to him. Holy Father. No, just leave him here. It's okay. I just want to say one more thing to you, Sam. Your heart is so broken. It's so broken. And in the past, it's been the place of that brokenness and humility that has God has been drawn to you and you've, you've, it's been so sweet. But I hear the Lord tell me to tell you this, that uh, it's time for a healing of that broken heart. Because if, if it stays broken like it is, it'll be too hard to endure what's next. And there's a healing to come to your heart. The brokenness was great. And you will stay tender, but there's a healing of the broken places that's coming to you. Even as you're laying here on the floor, there is a ministry of heaven to heal you. Heal you, man of God. You need to be healed. Your soul needs to be healed. Your life is being healed. Father, you're like sewing them together right now. Everyone stretch your hands towards this man. There's a miracle of healing coming over him. That's It's more than physical. It's a life healing. Lord, you're coming to heal and put together pieces of the heart. Lord, baptize him in healing. Lord, all weekend, Lord, let him just be under the atmosphere of being restored and restored and restored and restored as a man. Not even just as a minister, Lord, as a man, as a person who's fought hard and long and been through many battles and has many wounds. Lord, heal him, oh God. Everyone say, heal him, Lord. Say it again, heal him, Lord. One more time, heal him, Lord. It's the mercy of God, Sam, to heal you and you'll be healed. song that I want to sing to you and it's really a, a prayer from you to to him take the coal from the altar purge my heart and purge my lips for you take the coal from the altar and purge my heart, Lord, purge my lips for you. Set me on fire. Set me on fire. Set me on fire. 
Lord set me on fire. Oh, take the coal from the altar and purge my heart, purge my lips for you. Take the coal from the altar and purge my heart, purge my lips for you, set me on fire. Set me on fire. Set me on fire. Do it, God. Hey. Set me on fire. Set me on fire. Oh, God. Set me on fire. On, this is us. This was him, but the same thing is here for us. Right? Set me on fire, Lord. Come on, set me on fire.
person we need to minister to. But let me say this about Sam. You don't know him. But when Steve Hill was dying, and he had a mega church in Dallas, Texas, they called him. They called him. That's who he is. He's a pastor to pastors. And so every prophetic word that has come here tonight, it's right. It's right on. It's right on. It's right in the spot for where he's at. And, you know, I'm so grateful that he's here. I'm so grateful that you received him. Can we just get, give a, a praise offering to, to God? Okay. One of the things, one of the things that I... I don't even have the words to express what just took place. One of the things that I love about the prophetic, when it's pure, it is so futuristic and it's full of hope. And it points you in the direction of the wind not the past we were in Dallas a few years ago <laughs> and I have I have had major prophets in my life being Benny's brother you're gonna meet the best and the worst <laughs> when I met David Hudson I there was something very different but he was the only prophet. And the reason I asked for the mic is because this is what, Saturday? No, Friday night? So you have these remaining services. But he's the only prophet I've ever met that wanted to be held accountable. And we were in Dallas. We were in Dallas with mom. And he said, it's the first time in 30-something years of ministry I've ever seen this done, ever. Maybe I just was running with the wrong ones. I don't know. But it was the first time, Paul, I had ever seen a prophet stand up and say, I was here last year, and I gave prophetic words. And I want to be held accountable to the words that I released. And he had a mic set up here and a mic set up there and he had the people stand. And he literally held himself accountable to the word that he released. And that if he had not, if he had missed it, he wanted to be held accountable. And people lined up probably for the next hour and came testimony after testimony after testimony, after testimony, after testimony, that the word that he prophesied the year previous had come to pass in these people's lives. But it was the first time in my life that I had literally heard a prophet say, I want to be held accountable. So I want to say this to you. Do not take these gifts that are on this platform, and I don't mean gifts as in the charismatic circle, but the anointing that is that rests on these men because there are things that were said that no one but a few people know and now you all know but it wasn't a you knowing that concerns me it was that God literally spoke to me of about what is about to happen in my life in my relationship because when I tell you this is vulnerability and this is accountability and don't come up here and don't receive a word without being vulnerable enough and and being held accountable that you're going to do something about that and so I just want to tell these men I have no words I have no words for what I just heard. But if there was ever a God moment in my life, at this season in my life, it just happened. And it wasn't the end of something. 
It, it wasn't the end of something, it is the beginning of something. And I, I would have never come, I would have never come to this city had it not been for two people. And that is Brian and Benita Ford. And so I'm very, very grateful that I get to share this moment with them. Ask them to come forward. And so Brian and Benita, David asked that you guys come up here, please. And that wasn't because of what I just said. He had asked me that before that. Come on the platform. Men of God, thank you for being so obedient to the Lord because my life will take on a whole new trajectory as a result. And I thank you. So let me ask, let me ask you while they're coming, Sam, how many crusades with Benny have you done? <laughs> Hundreds? Yeah. How many, how many people have you ministered to throughout the world? Hundreds of thousands? A lot. You've seen the glory of God. You've seen God moments. But you're saying tonight that this was a God moment for you. I would say that tonight, you know what God has to do sometimes is he has to dismantle a lot of things before he can build. Come on, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul and I were having this conversation when we talked, God is dismantling the system. And he's been dismantling the system in me that I'm actually a part of called the church. Not the people, the system. So I will say that I love you. A little. A little. I would say that tonight, by far, was the most powerful and most eye-opening and most God moment in 38 years of serving Jesus. Hallelujah. Far greater than anything I've ever experienced. And I mean it. Come on, just give praise to God. Give praise to God. Can we bless this beautiful couple? They they are from Raleigh. Can you lift your hands to them? Can we bless them? Yes. And the prophets have a prophetic word for them. So Tom's going to go first. Honestly, I'm just going to start off with what I saw. When I looked at you, I felt great compassion for you, especially for you, because I saw a, a, a hope deferred that you have fought and fought for something to be here, of substance in this part of the world for so long. And it seems like when something was going to arrive, it fell apart. And then you gathered again, and you gathered with people, and you prayed, and you wept, and, and it, it looked like it was going to work, and then it didn't. And that just kept repeating. And it's like to the point where you're in this meeting and you're saying, God, I want to I wanna believe that again, but oh, it's so painful. What I've been through. And it's like you, you put your hands in and you work and then it, it seems like it just begins to fall through the fingers. And I mean like dear relationships with people, women that you prayed with, that you wept with, that were we're, we're going to die together and they're gone and they're gone and they're gone and there's you've had seasons of being like it's very alone in it thinking Lord what what will it take and I saw great tears and, and you guys are up here and you're so handsome and beautiful and everything but, but the thing is, is in, before God when you're by yourself there is great tears and great brokenness and said Lord Heal us. Have mercy on us, Lord, and give us the real deal. Before, before we die, give us the real thing. I want to get off sand. I don't want to stand with people on sand anymore, and it's always shifting. I want to get on rock, and I want to be planted on something that's rock under our feet that we can stand on and work out of and that builds and builds and doesn't fall apart later. It lasts and lasts. 
so this hope deferred is a breaking of it is a, is a hope deferred not that you've lost your faith but it's like the weight of all that is heavy it is a breaking of it to come over your life and to restore a joy and even I dare I say a faith that's idealistic that says this will work it will work and we will work and we will answer the call of God and even the naysayers and man I just I just gosh I don't know how this happened, but even like preachers and famous preachers said bad things about you or despairing things about you. And you need to understand this. God didn't say that stuff. And there, there are wounds and words put upon you by men that they said in the beginning and welcomed you, and then they came back later and slapped you with their words and their, and their definitions and said, because I'm the anointed man of God, my words define you. And they tried to cut your feet out from underneath you because they saw you as a competitive threat to their ministry and their vitality. And they used you in the beginning. This is the word of the Lord. They used you in the beginning to get something from you. But when they saw who you were, they felt the competition and their own insecurity made them use their own words improperly to judge you in ways that God didn't. And I hear the Lord saying, today I break the curse of what men have said. I break the curse of it over your spirit. Every time you were said to be a Jezebel, every time you were said to be a false prophetess, every time you were said to be some false spirit, I break the curse of hell's power. I command it to be broken over your spirit. Loose her. Every lie of hell, loose her. Every demonic tormentor, loose her. Hey. I hear the Lord saying, I'm restoring your soul. I'm restoring your soul. Everyone, stretch your hands just for a moment. There is a restoration. Sister, just let this fall upon you. There is a restoration of your soul hovering over you right now. The Spirit of God is breathing life into you. Woo. Just pick her back up. There, there's a demonic power that you're going to get free of tonight. And it's a, it's, it's a spirit of grief. And it's this, this thing that he just prophesied and everything that, that you went on, there's a demonic spirit called grief that has vexed your soul. And tonight you're going to get free of it. You're not going to carry it out of this meeting. says that there's a spirit that's came upon you it doesn't make you bad it makes you wounded and through this grief that's in your life something is entered so I'm just going to speak to it nice and easy like Sunday morning and we're just going to pull this thing right out is that okay in the name of Jesus by the authority of heaven I speak to a spirit of grief. And I just command it right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to loose her right now in Jesus' name. And come off of her right now. Loose her every bit. Loose her every bit right now in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I just ask that your spirit now just come. A spirit of joy. A spirit of joy just kind of settling in on her right now in Jesus' name. It's almost as if I, I see a little girl before me giggling. The kind that, that giggles at the supper table. And dad's got to say, would you hush down? And I, I can just see you just giggling and giggling. That this, this weight has been lifted off of your shoulders. And joy is beginning to come right now. That God said that joy comes in the morning. And this is your morning. This is your morning when light has broken through. 
in the name of Jesus. Now, God bless her with laughter. Let her be giggling tonight. Let her be laying in bed and just begin to giggle. Reaches over and says, what are, you, what, are you, what are you laughing about? I'm just happy. I'm just happy. Let it be so, God, that this day, from now on, she'll be smiling. And then she'll bring joy to other people. Because she'll be able to locate, she'll be able to identify mourning. She'll be able to identify bondage. And God give her the grace to walk up and say, in Jesus' name, I can help you be free. I, bl- I see that God's actually giving you, if I, if I could just say this this new ministry in your life of joy of joy in Jesus name Amen God bless you I just want to just say something the reason this moment is so important is that you have to get fully free of the past seasons to begin to enter into what God has for you. It's like you can't even see the future right now. It's like, Lord, can I even believe again? Can I hope again? Can I rise up again? Can I do this all over again? And the answer is, no, you can't right now. But after this moment, you're going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to do it. I see you like as a little girl saying, Lord, I want my life to count for something that's significant and to have real purpose and real meaning. And the grief and the disappointment that has been in your heart is like, Lord, did I ever think it would just all come to this? And I hear the Lord saying, out of the burnt ashes of your life, I am going to raise up something new. And it will live and not die. It will live and not die it will live and not die and I just hear the Lord saying this is the moment to pass from death to life and to fully come over into the resurrection Father right now come on just stretch your hands towards this lady Father right now as we just lay hands on her we thank you that there is a season that is turning right now Lord we thank you the old is the old And, Lord, you are thrusting her right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, into something new, something that she's never expected, something that she's never even fully seen. Father, right now, the power of God, let it hit her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet and set her free and release her fully into the future. In Jesus' name. You're an honorable man, sir. You've been a terrible battle in your life as you've watched. Let's say this, you love your wife so much, you've worked very hard to try to build anything she sees. And to see you walking with her, and if she really hears from God, because you love her and know her so well, you're like, then I'll go make that happen. And the um, the, um, faithfulness you've operated in God commends you for your obedience and the humility you've walked in. You've been around other strong men before, even leaders like this, and they didn't measure you rightly. They let you in on things they wanted to use you for and your resources for or whatever you had, but but didn't really want you. And that all changes. You cannot just come for your whatever resource, talent, or things that you have in the treasury of your life. What's next needs to become because of come, come because of who you are, not what you can do and bring. Because of who you are, a faithful man, a faithful steward, a friend, someone who sees things that doesn't yell for the microphone, but if we'd stop and listen, we could hear the truth. You watch things. 
and want to come around and say, you know, you're missing this here. You didn't see that there. And it intimidated people. But you're going to come out of that. And God's going to set you with people, brother, where your voice can be heard, your wisdom. You have a, a, a wisdom in your heart to give and to share in all kinds of things, even natural things and practical things that churches are scant on. Even like, um, gosh, the management of things, numbers, these kinds of things. There's, there's skill sets you have. I can just see you building things. I see you looking at computer screens and thinking through things and saying, this tells us this. This shows us we're going here. And if you'd pay attention, we'd make it. And if you don't, we're going to miss it. And your, wo- your voice went unheeded. And while it's blessed you, others have lost out because of their own pride. But I hear the Lord saying, I'm going to set you with people. Hear this. God says, I am going to set you with people who will listen to you. I will set you with people where you can set your hand to things and it'll work. Father, right now we're asking, oh God, that you open the door into this man's future. There's a loneliness in you, brother, for true friendship. Not ministry friendship, not stage friendship, not, not the facade of it, but the depth of it that says, this is who I really am. And I want to love people and be in a family where we love one another. And it's real and not a show. Father, I thank you. You're bringing this man into that. Everyone stretch your hands towards him. There's an anointing coming upon him right now to release him from the pain of the loneliness of this last season. There is such a loneliness here and such a sorrow of the mistreatment of their family and the wife who he loves so much to be told such bad things about. The times you thought, do I go fight? Do I hold her? What do I do? And there's been great turmoil in your own heart. Even your role to play is the attacks that come against your wife. I hear the Lord saying, I'm coming to heal you of all the war, to heal you of all the poor treatment, or to heal you of all the things that were said about you and her. Father, I think you're coming to help him right here. In the name of Jesus, the tenderness of your heart is so precious, sir. Thank you for it. back and stand by your wife. You don't have to stand. Just just stay there. Just stay there. Just grab her hand. The prophetic words that have come forth tonight are true and they're correct. And I'm going to add my small part. You never really knew who you were. You've always been obedient in the best ways, but you are Aquila and Priscilla, and you have been involved in starting things again and again, and then giving them away and seeing them die. But this time, it's not going to happen that way. This time, I'm going to bring around you the resources and the people to get the job done. They started in Ephesus, they ended. Everywhere they went, there was supply and resource, and they started and they pioneered. And this is what I've done with you. So in the days to come, what you have just stepped into, into the great building projects that are coming, it's not one, it's not two. I'm going to have you do projects with the most interesting and innovative architects and creators in this nation and beyond. And it's hundreds of houses that will have your thumbprint. You've seen it, you've done it, and you are both going to do it. And in the days to come, you will even have a company in Europe, and you will have a home there. Because it is by design, my design, that this would happen for both of you. And the question will be, what is the purpose in this? The purpose is to be who you are and what you are, and to reproduce it again and again and again. So I'm not taking anything away from you. I'm adding things to you. I'm going to give you all that you need, but this time you are not going to stand alone. I'm creating a team around you, a team, not of supply, not of resource, but of 
counsel and wisdom and strength and covering. And I'm going to walk with you so that everything that you see upon the earth will happen. When I see houses, I'm seeing hundreds of houses. And not the little ones that are uh, Habitat for Humanity. I'm talking about mansions. Innovative architects throughout the earth that you are going to meet, you are going to align with. And what you will be doing by design will be shaping community. Okay, one more thing here. There's a planned community that is coming, a planned community that isn't even here yet, but it's coming. And they're going to come to you and they're going to say, would you be a part of this? And you're going to say, this is way too big for us. But when this planned community comes, at that time and in that place, I will give you the strategy and the personnel. You will not build these things by yourself. You will facilitate it and leave your thumbprint and your fingerprints upon all of this. And the reason why I am doing this is to show a pattern of how kingdom and marketplace and real estate and beyond can happen. And I am with you, says the Lord. Can we say amen? amen.
prophets and people here. But I, I just feel heartbroken. When I look at you, because this is what leaders in the body of Christ have done to good people. And we need to be better than this. We need to do better than this. And that's really what these meetings are about and what we're doing here. Is we want something authentic and real. And I pray that the pain that you have suffered, that you wouldn't become so deferred because of bad leaders, that you wouldn't give your life again for the body of Christ because so much would be lost and missed. And I just ask that you, I stand as a representation of those that have mishandled and mistreated. And I ask you to forgive them. Forgive them. You deserve better than what you've had and the way that you've been treated. Father, I ask tonight that this would be the beginning of restoration. Lord, that the oil Lord, would be poured upon this couple. That the pain that they've endured would be lifted off of them once and for all. And Lord, that you would bring men and women of God around them that would be true friends, that would be authentic. Lord, that would have the right motives towards them. That would have nothing but good for them. And God, I ask, Lord, that you would begin to provide, Lord, those type of men and women. And Lord, that you would cause these people to find their place in a company of men and women that are seeking your face and that they could find their purpose and their destiny. Lord, I thank you that you found them tonight. And that you're going to place them once again, Lord, in the body of Christ, where they belong, to be handled the way that you would handle them, to love them the way that you would love them, to receive them the way that you would receive them. Lord, let the ministry of reconciliation have its full work here tonight, so that these gifts, but even more importantly, these lives would not be lost but they would fully wholeheartedly do your will we thank you break every curse break every demonic stronghold that has got in the middle of this and Lord release them now into your body and into your will in Jesus name When, I, when we worship, when we were in worship, I kept seeing a tomb, somebody's casket, somebody's tomb, and I even I told Pastor Sam I said he was he, he was asking me what was I seeing, and I said I got you beat because I don't I, I either I'm going to die tonight or something, and I heard the Lord say He would rise people up. I didn't know it was me. But years ago, I, I wrote a book, and I published it. Pastor Sam helped me in the name of it was Christ died for your enemy. Because I had so many people come against me, and I know it would live out my life with me so that I would stay in forgiveness to people. But I just believe tonight 
when I walk out those doors, I do believe there's going to be a change. Come on. I leaned over to Sam and I, I told him, I said, you know, our mothers are in heaven, but our mother's prayer has brought our lives together. And what's amazing is that I was in his brother's meeting probably about, I don't know, 25 years ago. My wife was in his brother's meeting before I went to one of the meetings. And she got pulled down on the front row and the glory of God came on her and I couldn't talk to her for a week. And anybody knows my wife, if she's in the glory of God, it's really the glory of God because she's usually working and doesn't want to be messed with by the presence because it keeps her from working. But she was in the glory of God for a week and she drugged me to your brother's meeting. I was in a meeting and Jesus stood and talked to me face to face. And now here I am looking at you face to face. Yeah. Well, that's not quite the same encounter, but... <laughs> Yeah, but in the, it, the kingdom's big, but it's small all at yeah. the same time. It really is. It really is. So we're, we're grateful you're here. On behalf of my journey in the Lord, and I can speak for Brian and Benita because we've walked together these last several years, thank you. Thank you for the words of healing. Thank you for breaking the past that they've walked walked through. Thank you for allowing God to use you the way he did. Thank you. Don't ever take this for granted, folks. Don't ever take this for granted. Don't ever take it for granted. Praise God. Can we just give the Lord just a mighty round of praise? Well, find two or three people and just say, we're just getting started. It might be your turn tomorrow. Can you do that? And we're back here at what time? Nine o'clock? Is it nine o'clock? Where's Angel? Angel, is it nine or 10 in the morning? 10. 10 a.m. in the morning. Get some rest. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Coffee starts at nine.